Achtung, Achtung, welcome to We Have Ways of Making You Talk with me, Al Murray, and of course, James Holland. Uh, uh, it's Monday morning. Uh, we, we're, we record these on a Monday sometimes, and they come out on another day. There, we've let you in on a little bit of the secret Can you believe it? how we do this. Sometimes we do it on a Thursday. <laughs> I know, it's extraordinary, isn't it's it? It's amazing, um, isn't it? <laughs> But it's Monday morning, and uh, today we're going to veer off our normal course, and we're going to talk about, about something that isn't the Second World War. Now, hold on. Before you press that pause or delete button on your iPhone or other devices are available, um, this is directly tied to the Second World War, and it's also a current thing that's pinging around in the news at the moment, and a thing I'm involved in to an extent. And So what we're going to do today is talk about the plight, and I think plight is the right word, of the British nuclear test veterans. And we're joined today by uh, Susie Boniface um, from the Sunday Mirror. Some of the time you're from the Sunday Mirror. I mean, you it's, know, the, it's just the mirror these days. They've smashed it's them just all the together. Mirror these days. They squished them all today. They don't just do it on a Sunday. OK, <laughs> so um, who has been campaigning on behalf of the nuclear te- British nuclear test veterans um, for, uh, well, almost a radioactive half-life um, is, the, is the truth for forever. And it's uh, uh, we, we've talked about this a lot haven't we Susie this is sort of your this is your um your bet noir isn't it this is the thing you have really hung on to for years and years and years because it's isn't it yeah yeah it's um I mean I probably first got involved in 2002 it was the year I first joined the Sunday Mirror uh, and that was also the 50th anniversary of the first British nuclear bomb test Operation Hurricane in 1952 when they blew up uh, an old ship called HMS Plym off the Montebello Islands off the northwest coast of Australia and <clears throat> um there was a huge piece done in the mirror for it at the time. Uh, now, in the 80s, when the test veterans first came forward, uh, there was a legendary newspaper editor called Richard Stott, who I think he's the only person to edit two national newspapers twice. He edited The People in the Mirror. And by 2002, uh, he used to campaign for the veterans in the 80s when, when we had millions and millions and millions of readers. And uh, in 2002, by then, he was the columnist for the Sunday Mirror. And he rang up his, uh, the editor, who was one of his protégés, Tina Weaver, one day, and said, what are you doing for the anniversary? And she said, what anniversary? And I heard a version of the story that said Stotty blew his lid. And they ended up doing a massive investigation, a front page which said cursed, and had a veteran there, his daughter and the granddaughter, and the health defects that had gone down the generations. Inside, uh, a reporter who worked in the paper called Alan Rimmer had... Um, chased down about 350 families that they'd first reported on back in the 80s and collected loads of information about their health problems and passed it to a statistician who had found a shockingly high rates of Down syndrome, leukaemia, infant mortality uh, and deaths amongst the men as well, miscarriages amongst the wives. This was a big thing in the paper that they did really huge. And I think I've got a vague memory that I I spoke to a couple of veterans on it. I did some case studies or something at the time. I didn't get a byline on any of the test veteran stories, probably till about 2004, 2005. Um, And it's been fairly consistent on and off since then. So somewhere between 15 and 18 years. So the the history of this, though, does does, does go back to the the Second World War. Because after all, the, the, the reason the British are having to test their own bomb is because... In 1940, you get tube alloys underway, don't you, James? Which is which is the the which is the British nuclear or atom weapon thing that that Churchill institutes. Yeah. Already, already Einstein has written. I mean, this is a bizarre the sort of names that get flung around. Einstein writes to Roosevelt says you're going to have to build this weapon to deal with the Germans. Tube alloys is too expensive. We have nowhere. The British have nowhere to test a weapon, which is after all why we end up in the Pacific. Anyway, we have nowhere to test a weapon. The Americans build a weapon and then at the end of the war, right at the death, shut the British out of any future weapons development, don't they? Yeah. Truman Truman does that, doesn't he? Yeah, it's funny. You you can see the writing on the wall by the time they get to just before. You know, they're very reluctant. Do you remember that um, Leonard Cheshire, the legendary uh, wing commander, is on the uh, or group captain by that point? Um, is is sort of slated to be on a, a, as an observer. He does, but only reluctantly. You know, it is it is made very clear to the British that they're not really wanted. That this is an American show. This is an American thing, and suddenly it's like the shutters are starting to come down a bit, uh, uh, and it's and it's an absolute marker for what's going to come. Uh, and it's a it is you know it's it's it shows the kind of sort of utter ruthlessness of the Americans, but also everything has changed now that the war is ending or has ended. 
and, and that this is a new dawn. Uh, and actually, America, right from the word go, is accepting that it is, uh, rather than being sort of isolationist as it used to be, it is now now a world player and it has a place to play in foreign policy throughout the world. Uh, and in terms of this awesome new weapon, it is going alone. Um, so all the Americans, all the British scientists uh, and um, German um, scientists who were working originally in Britain uh, before being transferred over to America for the uh, Manhattan Project, all of them are kind of frozen out. So, so and then you get the Attlee government and, and this whole, as long as we stick a bloody Union Jack on the top of it, development of a nuclear weapon programme, which then leads, when Churchill then gets into government, Churchill discovers that, that um, Attlee's been spending this money secretly and hasn't told Parliament. He's gonna, and he's got, they spend a million pounds on the. Uh, oh uh, no! A it million. Was a million pounds. <laughs> it was a hundred. Pounds. It was a hundred million pounds in that money at that time, and it yeah. turned. That's about the equivalent of about three billion now. Yeah, but they said they'd spent a million. That's the million that's kept from Parliament, and 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 Churchill Churchill threatens to throw his toys out the pram. But then, but the point I'm making is this is all wreathed in. It's wrapped up in all sorts of things. So it's wrapped up in Britain needing to. I mean, America's saying, well, we're a world player now. It doesn't want any other world players. Britain feeling it has to run to catch up, assert itself as a global power, even as the empire's shrinking and the money's running out. And then the secrecy surrounding all this, which is really, I think, the core of why the veterans were treated so poorly. The test veterans were treat- treated so poorly from the initially, isn't it? Is This is all super top secret, even though, it's be- even though when you detonate a nuclear weapon... It- in a test that is a public display of where your technology arrived there's no hiding it there's no there's no getting away from the fact you've done that is there well you wouldn't have thought so no well you wouldn't have thought so (laughs) well they but they they certainly try don't they They, so so the so the first test hurricanes in 52 then what then what follows susan there was that letter from einstein to roosevelt in 39 which interestingly by 1955 he he and bertrand russell were writing letters saying please don't have a nuclear war he changed his (laughs) mind well done einstein (laughs) Um, and, and William Penny, who was the uh, mathematician, the scientist, who was the father of the, the British bomb project, he started out, he started building, uh, he was working on Mulberry Harbours, which we used at D-Day, of course. And his specialism was working out the shock waves and blast waves and how they were going to affect things. So he then goes over to America, to Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project, along with a guy called Klaus Fuchs, who was a, unbeknown to anybody at the time, a Soviet double agent, uh, a communist who escaped uh, Germany after the Reichstag fire. And then in 46, as James said, you had the Atomic Energy Act when Truman goes, we've got the most amazing weapon on Earth. No one's having it. And all the Allies had thought, you know, you have Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 200,000 people were obliterated uh, almost instantly. And the ones who died in the in the days and weeks afterwards died horribly. The, some of the descriptions are absolutely horrifying. After a, a war which, you know, killed 56 million people, it was considered that that was a price worth paying to bring it to an end. Everyone thought, oh great, okay, the the side of the goodies now has this most awful, powerful weapon, brilliant. Uh, and they start, the Britons started stockpiling plutonium because they expected the Americans would give us the tech. But at and the same Truman... time, it's sort of, you know, there is also this growing worry, sorry to interrupt Susie, but you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like the ring precious. I mean, you know, it kind of, you know, all that power, all that control, you know, what happens if, you you know, if you get corrupted by it? You know, it's no good having just one person in the planet, you know, one nation in the planet having having such an awesome weapon. You know, it needs a, it needs an offset. They need and nine, nine this, to hold the ring. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's this also this other feeling that, that, of course, that you know, if you want to be a serious player um, and you've got nuclear power and, and, you know, only one other country has, then that automatically gives you that, seat of authority at the top table which of course britain is very reluctant to give up well there was also a lot of fear because um the americans had this tech and they were keeping it to themselves uh viscount charwell who is one of uh the post-war advisors said look we face becoming effectively a colony of the united states the british empire becoming a colony that's not okay you know he said that we we will be equivalent to the native levies that were allowed to have small arms but no big weapons for fear of what they might do and who they might turn it on their masters so there was this fear that we would not only be left out in the cold but that we would be you know uh, sub- lower sub- subliminal to the the new power would just be america and they would be the only people running with things and then there's also a very reasonable fear because the soviets were building 
nuclear weapons. 1948. The, exactly. The, the, the diaspora, the physicist diaspora who had left Europe and fled ahead of the Nazis were communists and they were Jews and they were just normal, ordinary physicists. And uh, they worked at the Manhattan Project. And then some of them quite naturally wanted to go home. Some of them wanted to go to Israel. Uh, some of them wanted to help communist nations because the idea... That only America had this weapon meant that even its allies were now at risk of Soviet attack and invasion. And they thought, Anna, you can't just leave us out here on our own dealing yeah, with this. Yeah, yeah. You know, we actually do need some genuine protection here. And this was, you know, this was the most devastating weapon. I mean, before Hiroshima, Truman warned that without surrendering, Japan could expect a reign of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. It took two of those before Japan gave well, in. Well, he was quite right, wasn't he? Yeah, and there's there's a there's an account of the attack in Life magazine which is worth reading, which says people's bodies were terribly squeezed and their internal organs ruptured. Then the blast blew the broken bodies at five hundred to a thousand miles an hour through the flaming rubble-filled air. Practically everybody within a radius of six and a half thousand feet was killed or seriously injured, and all buildings crushed or disemboweled. And you know Hiroshima was on a, a flat river delta so the blast had loads of space to expand out in nagasaki which was uh targeted after kyoto was decided not to be targeted because it was too culturally important apparently one of the americans had been there on a holiday and he didn't want to blow it up uh and so they chose nagasaki but it had lots of hills around it and that concentrated the blast back in and made it significantly worse and this this is a it was also the secondary target wasn't it it was the the secondary target target. yeah yeah Yeah. but nagasaki was 20 kilotons and it did this, that appalling description there. I mean, there was a photographer, Bernard Hoffman, who was uh, worked for Life magazine, and he went into Grand Zero a few days later, September the 3rd, and said, we saw Hiroshima today, or what's left of it. We were so shocked with what we saw that most of us felt like weeping, not out of sympathy for the Japs, but because we were revolted by this new and terrible form of destruction. Compared to Hiroshima, he said, Berlin, Hamburg and Cologne are practically untouched. You know, this is the... They thought first well, we were going to have to be fair. They us. weren't. I mean, <laughs> and, 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 um, I don't know. If you know, there's been lots of there's the, you can you can read almost verbatim the same accounts of people wandering through the street, the the rubble torn streets of Cologne and Hamburg and Fort Simon, and all the rest of it. I mean, mm. the, the bottom line is is kind of you know mass area bombing of cities is is horrific, whichever way you look at it. Um, and and the the problem is is that it's one thing sending over kind of thousands of of um, of bombers in these sort of huge fleets, which comes with all sorts of problems for the for those who are delivering the bombs as well. But when you can cause that much damage with one bomb, one plane, that is just completely changes everything and it's really interesting that once the ussr do kind of sort of um, test their first bomb in 1948 britain's main concern is not that that the soviet union is going to attack them and you've just hinted on this susie it is that the united states will cause it because americans have um have air bases still in in the uk and the fear is that the americans will do a preemptive strike on the soviet union and that the Soviet Union that will then retaliate. And the only way they can realistically retaliate is by dropping a nuke or an atomic bomb on Britain, not the United States. Because they can't reach the United States in the 1940s or even in the 1950s. Uh, and, and that is the big fear. So one of the driving... Um, so, so if there was any doubt about it, after the Soviet Union tests its bomb, it is, we have to do this or else we could get caught in the crosshairs. That's, that's the main driving reason for it and and you know one can argue the toss over whether that was a good decision or a bad decision but that is why it happens yeah but at the start the americans just wanted it for themselves and then Correct. as things progressed they realized that people like klaus fuchs were selling stuff to them well they were selling they were giving stuff to the soviets i mean fuchs wasn't fat was discovered until 1949 and they used this um amazing code breaking system called venona which was uh, in place during the second world war and they invented it and they started finding there was an agent called uh, rest i think his name was or charles a couple of names who was uh, transmitting stuff to the russians they didn't find him until 49 and they had a spe- they couldn't find anything on Fuchs's phone they had a couple of the last sort of people that they thought it might be and Fuchs by this point is working at Harwell at the atomic energy research establishment and he'd got MI5 clearance to work there he had been mm. approved by the spooks Klaus Fuchs a good thing 
discuss five minutes. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? But that, but that, but that, isn't it? I mean, Didn't he do us all we, a favour? You know, because what could... happens if America had just had it on their own? Well, there's the wormhole we could we could easily run down. <laughs> yeah, and he gave it to China as well in the end, so yeah. Ooh, it helps yeah. helps that grow. But you know, he he they had they had they couldn't find anything on him. They tapped his phone, and then as they had a special branch officer who sort of befriended him, and then eventually just confronted him with the suspicions. And Fuchs denied it all. And then he came back a few days later and confessed because his conscience just said, actually, no, I admit, I did do this and this is why I did it. And he had a a kangaroo court. I think he did 14 months uh, and then left and then helped the Soviets and helped the Chinese and carried on about his way. Wow. You know, and that that, that didn't come out. I think it was 14 months. Was I, I might be wrong. It's fourteen something. How could that be? Was, <laughs> um, it was they. You know, they. Um, by the time that that all came out, then the Americans had the excuse to say, "Well, look, you are you are riddled with Soviet spies. We're not. We can't tell you stuff, even if we wanted to now." Mm. And so then Britain had to prove eventually, sort of by fifty eight, with our biggest blast grapple, why we'd prove that we we're actually technologically slightly ahead of the Americans, and therefore they they brought us back in. And now. Like you said, James, the nuclear weapons we have now are rented from the Americans. And if something yep. goes wrong with them, if they have, they have to go back to America to have the wiring checked. It's not, mm. then we're not allowed to play with them. It was 14 years. Sorry, it was 14 years 14 in jail, years. Fitz now, Scott. So, so you just <laughs> mentioned Grapple Y, and it's Grapple Y really that is the... When we, when we, the last bit of campaigning we did the year before last, when, when we went to see Gavin Williamson, but they wouldn't let me in the room with him. Um, uh, the, um, <laughs> oh yeah, we went to the Ministry of Defence. We find, I mean, Susie's been like absolutely um, dogged with this, and we go to, we go, we do a day's press, and we we had a day at the, we had a day in the House of Commons in the Palace of Westminster in one of the little side rooms there, where most of the Labour Party came through, although they couldn't all come in at the same time because they all despised no. each other. But they said that uh, was, you know, that was an unprecedentedly popular. You know, a little parliamentary yep. trip when a, a, a lobbyist kind of lobby group kind of turns up. They'd never had one of the, We had a little side room because they weren't expecting more than 20 people. And we must yeah. we had 60 or 80 or so. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, uh, and, and then we went to see the Ministry of Defence and Gavin Williams. They let everyone in except me. Um, so I had to wait in the lobby at the MOD. Uh, anyway, that's beside the point. It's so did, he, did he read? Hold on a minute. Did, did he really say, yeah, I'll let Susie in and I'll let him in and I'll let her in. But I'm not having that Al Murray in. That's You're exactly what happened. No, no. They, didn't let me in. they didn't let me in either. Oh, you James. weren't allowed in either, were you? No. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't let me in on principle, but they didn't let Al Murray in just, just because he was just wasn't on the list. But it's Grapple Y that is the high watermark of, Brit- of, of British uh, uh, atomic weapon, nuclear weapon testing, isn't it? Which is which is a re- a hydrogen bomb. So they've made that advanced technologically, and this is an incredibly powerful weapon. I mean, you've talked about the yields at um, uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki. What's the Grapple Y weapon? A Grapple Y was done in a rush and it was done uh, badly. All the safety protocols were thrown out the window. But Grapple Y's yield uh, was officially three megatons, which is, uh, you know, three uh, thousand kilotons compared to, say, Nagasaki was 20 kilotons. So it's about 150 times stronger than Nagasaki. And because of the difference between fission and fusion, the devastating potential for the destructive power was just exponentially greater. And this was why we had to have the H-bomb. When we exploded a hurricane in 52, that was October 52, and Churchill read out to Parliament, you know, it was, it was a million degrees in the heart of the fireball. We are now a nuclear power. Everything's dandy, whoop de doo and then a month later, the Americans exploded their first H-bomb. And it was like, oh, shit. And everyone's back to square one again. Suddenly, we don't have an atom bomb. We've got a pea shooter. And so everything between 52 and 58, when uh, Grapple Y exploded, was a desperate race to go thermonuclear. And there were several... And it's, it's difficult to say that one test was worse than the other. Grapple Y was the biggest. But in between, there were hundreds of experiments which were all aimed at trying to get to Grapple Y. So um, after 52 at Hurricane, they then moved on land in Australia, to South Australia, places near the Woomera rocket range, where they started um, two tests. There was Totem 1 and 2, which were uh, 8, 9, 10 kilotons. But after one of those, there was a black mist reported rolling across the landscape. They had forcibly resettled 
Aboriginal tribes people around there. Uh, and they thought that some of them were far enough away not to be affected. But th- this black mist was seen 300 kilometres to the north. Uh, it sent people blind. It poisoned water holes. It was tragic. And in you know, 19, in the 1950s, they didn't even count Aboriginal people, much less give them health care or death certificates. So there was never any real trace of what happened to a lot of them. It was all oral tradition. And then after Totem, there was, uh, well, either side of Totem, there were what they, the misnomer was, they called them minor trials, which happened at Maralinga and Emu Field, not far from Woomera, uh, which were basically, they were trying to find ways to set off a, a trigger device for the bomb. You know, your nuclear weapon is, uh, an atom bomb is your, uh, your radioactive material surrounded by TNT inside a big heavy jacket of a core, which compresses the blast of the TNT back in so that the radio active material uh, splits the atom and causes fission and the H bomb uh, is basically blowing up an atom bomb with another atom bomb so you have one of those inside yet another core so when the H bomb goes up and the atom um, atoms split and then they get smashed back together again by this second core around it and the people have heard that so there's this double crack you can just hear the two different bangs to get from one to the other they had uh, mosaic operation mosaic one and two which was up in the montebello islands again uh one of which was 98 kilotons six and a half seven times more powerful than nagasaki and that one blew back over the mainland uh the fallout cloud and they sent a ship called hms diana on for both mosaics steaming through the, to trace the chase the fallout cloud and then to steam in and out of it for eight hours a time and the effect the, the point of this was they wanted to test the effect on vessel and crew and the captain was a guy called john gower who was a hero of the arctic convoys uncle of david gower the cricketer and um he wrote uh, he became a campaigner for the test veterans after this uh, and he died in his 90s but every time they went to reunion they found more crew members had terrible illnesses and were dying off at a, a shocking rate i think there's about six members of diana's crew left alive and there was 300 at the time and then after that back at maralinga they had operation kittens and vixen uh, which were basically like a dirty bomb they were trying to blow up the trigger devices so they'd have a bit of plutonium and they wanted to see what would happen to it so they would start a fire next to it or they would have an explosion next to it or they'd have different amounts or they'd throw in some polonium and see what that did and so people who went back to that range would find what looked like lead shot all across the outback, about 300 kilometres of outback. And it was little tiny black pellets of plutonium. And you know, some plutonium isotopes have a half-life of a few days. Plutonium-239 has got a half-life of 24,100 years. Uranium-238 is four and a half billion years, right? Which is longer than the Earth has actually existed. And it would take longer than that for uranium-238 to get half as bad as it is. So they, they cleaned up uh, Maralinga three times and buried things in the sand and buried land rovers and stuff like that. And then after all this, then there were the thermonuclear tests, which were grapple at Christmas Island in the Pacific. And they started off with Grapple X 57, and that was supposed to be the H-bomb. That was what they'd been building towards. Mosaic 1 and 2 had had a little bit of fusion in them, but just to sort of see if they could increase the yield a bit, which is why the second one was suddenly 98 kilotons. Uh, And what they wanted to do was to turn all that and all the stuff they'd found about how plutonium spreads across the landscape and put this into an H-bomb. But Grapple X went off uh, and the Cassandra, who was the Mirror's famous columnist, Bill Connor, was there and wrote, this is a dress rehearsal for the end of the world. They're on a, a guard ship a long way away and saw this amazing explosion. And all the papers went big and said, this is the H-bomb, because that's what the British government had said. But the American observers were there and they said, no, that's that's not an H-bomb, is it? The yield is too low. It was about 1.8 megatons. And the, the British went, shit, you've busted us again. Uh, and so then after Grapple X, they were in a sudden rush. We have to do Grapple Y. And what was going on at the same time it was, I mean, CND was formed in about 53, I think. Uh, so there was actually huge public protest during this whole period. You know, Einstein had changed his mind in 55. There was wide scale um, opprobrium, disgust, shock, lots of words that this was not OK. I mean, Wilmera Rocket Range had people protesting about its use just for conventional rockets long before they started irradiating the place. Uh, they, they needed to do this in a rush. The comprehensive test ban treaties were coming in 
they were coming down the track. And so at Grapple Y, uh, well, at Operation Hurricane, according to the MOD, something like 92% of the men who were there had a dosimeter badge to see what their dose was. Not that they were very effective, but they had a badge. At Grapple Y, it was about 8%. Well, that's like just... a badge that changes colour if you've been exposed to radiation. It's like a bit of old, you know, camera film. It just right. shows if you've got some rays pinging through it. It right. picks up gamma radiation and a bit of low-level uh, alpha radiation, but it, yeah. won't, it won't do very much. And they, the developing fluid they had for it rotted in the sun or the barrels leaked or they yeah. didn't do it or they dropped them in the sea or ate them yeah. or something. So, um, but uh, grapple why, the safety protocols went out the window and, and there was no dissimilar badges. One of the most fascinating things about it, I was talking uh, a couple of years ago for a, a project on this to a journalist in Australia called Nick McClellan, who... Um, He's like the Australian version of me. He's doing the other end of this story. It's like the yeah. two of us on the planet. It was amazing to talk to him because we suddenly had so much in common. It's like talking to a twin. Uh, and he'd heard the same stories of death and illness and the same sort of patterns of, of what happened to the veterans yeah. in Pacific Islanders that he was talking to. Oh. Um, and he said one of the things he'd found in the colonial archives, which is something I can't access back here, and of course the MOD is pulling stuff out of the archives here but have been previously public very famously in the past past couple of years they've withdrawn stuff that's been public before uh, but there's still stuff in the colonial archives which no one else has seen and nick had found before grapple Y there was this map uh predicting the fallout patterns that they were expected to have and it drew the you know little circle in the ocean and this is where things were going to have fallout and then there was also a letter from a local plantation owner to the colonial authorities saying, uh, chaps, if you irradiate my bananas, I am going to sue. And then there was a second map covering exactly the same bit of ocean in which the fallout that was predicted was now drawn in a square. <laughs> right? Neatly avoiding all the banana plantations. Oh, and God. exactly. So me and Nick both had this same thing. Like part of the reason that you still keep doing this story for so long is that you come up against this kind of kafka-esque insane i mean saying kafka-esque i say all the damn time about this it doesn't yeah. quite cover it it's just it's insane it's a distortion of truth and reality well which brings us i think to to, uh, to the the plight of the of the test veterans because one of the things that they keep running into is this idea that well maybe you are sick maybe you do have problems in your family but you can't it can't be from the test, or if it is from the test, you're going to have to prove it. And yet, at the same time, you're t telling us right now that they were they were complete. And the MOD kind of go, you know, it's the infancy of this science. No one really knew what. No one really knew how poisonous these weapons were. Well, why are they? In which case, why are they drawing square fallout maps to to placate people? At the time, if they think, if they don't know these wep how dangerous these weapons are, if they don't know what the after effects of these weapon systems are, why are they covering up then um, if it's a, this innocent age of discovery? Exactly. You, you, you know what I mean? And, and, but and so but is, this, is this all because about the fear of litigation? Yes and no and other things. Uh, there were, there was, there's reports from the Medical Research Council in the 40s warning about the genetic hazards of radiation. So they knew that that was a possibility. Um, there is do declassified documents that I've got copies of which show they were concerned about the possible genetic effects on the men. There are documents saying we want to take blood tests before they go and these are the forms we are going to fill in to show that what the results of their white blood cell count is, for example. All the men who went were rated A1 fit before they went. Um, but if you try to get hold of that particular medical form now, the MOD says it doesn't exist. And 70 years on, it is possible they got destroyed or eaten or something, but someone someone saw what that was. And there's also the fact that after the test, they didn't do a subsequent blood count. John Gower said he couldn't believe if the test, if, if the Mosaic was aimed at testing what happened to his men, why no one followed them up for a medical checkup afterwards. Now, they're either negligent, they either didn't think it was necessary, or they knew what they'd find was not going to be good. So they didn't bother. Um, but, you know, the whole reason for the, the denial and the, the, the lack of kind of acknowledgement of what has happened isn't really a requirement of proof. 
because we have the proof from Australian Royal Commission, from declassified documents from the colonial archives, that the British government lied to the Australian ones about what they were doing and about the severity of what it was. They have admitted repeatedly that they did things that they had previously denied. Uh, in 2009, on the eve of a High Court case, the MOD admitted it probably irradiated 10% of the men, that about 2,000 of them were probably poisoned uh, if they were on the RAF aircrew flying sampling missions through the mushroom clouds, if they were in the decontamination uh, ground crew who washed down those planes afterwards, if they were in uh, uh, an indoctrinee force, Operation Buffalo, which happened in Maralinga in 57, when men were ordered to walk and march and crawl, leopard crawl, on their elbows through the fallout dust in order to see how much contaminated their uniforms. Um, so they they had they have admitted things. It's unbelievably cavalier, of course. isn't it? And they admitted that the crew of HMS Diana had probably been irradiated in two thousand and nine. For the previous fifty three years, they had denied Diana was in any danger. We're going to take a short break right now. We're talking to Susie Boniface about the British nuclear test veterans and the scandal surrounding it. Welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk. We're talking to Susie Boniface about the nuclear test veterans and their campaign for justice. I mean, I, I, I'm tr- sort of scraping them out around in my mind to think why they would be so short termist. You know, what the military think in being, you know, and maybe maybe what part of the thinking is, well, let's see what happens if we sail a ship through a mushroom cloud. Are the crew still all right 10 minutes later? Because that's when we're going to need them. It's the military thinking, well, how does this affect us immediately? And the idea that 40 years down the track, they might be, they might be having problems is sort of irrelevant to the sort of immediate tactical efficacy of a crew that's just sailed through a mushroom cloud. Do you see what I mean? That that might that might be what's going on. I mean, it's obviously not good enough because otherwise, how do you otherwise how do you explain this apart from you know it's cavalier, it's it's negligent, it's also rotten, it's rotten bloody, it's rotten bloody science, isn't it? If this is all a if this is all supposed to be a, a science experiment, it's rotten science not to follow up on the crew of that ship. Of it's, course, it's, if you've it, if you've it begs, sent them, it begs belief. If you've sent them in there, then I mean, do do the checks on them afterwards. Yeah. Unless now, was, un, unless what the idea is to see, well, well, what if they sail through a cloud? How many of them drop dead immediately? Well, none did, so that's all right. You just you, 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 you see what I mean? I'm just tr- trying to figure out what on earth the thinking could I, possibly I think be. That's the problem. There was no thinking. What they right. were trying every time they had a blast, they needed yeah. to get onto the next one. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah. they were so desperate to get. A mosaic done and send Diana through the fallout that by the time I mean Mount Batten was first sea lord at the time he went to uh, the Mont- Montebello Islands and stood on a rock and personally supervised preparations and addressed the crews and then cleared off and once they had Diana had been through the fallout they were expecting well you did that and well done and expecting some kind of a signal from the first sea lord and heard nothing at all they sailed back they weren't allowed to go into ports in Australia because the Australians knew Diana was hot. So they went into Singapore. They had to repaint the ship because she was pinking in the heat. And then she went back through Aden and Suez, got involved in the Suez crisis, downed an Egyptian frigate, took some rescued some people from the sea, and then got a signal from Mount Batten saying, oh, jolly well done, chaps. Because by then, Suez had just replaced... Diana, a Monty Better Mosaic. It was completely irrelevant by that point. And it was the same with everything else until you got to, to Grapple Y. But then after Grapple Y, once they had blown up this massive device, once the Americans went, actually, you know more about this than us now, you can come and help us with our bombs, and in return, we will give you access to our warheads. After that, the Americans did the majority of the tests. And one of the more awful and forgotten parts of this even is what was known as Operation Dominic, which is about 31 different tests all took place on Christmas Island, sort of under our uh, you know, colonial control. But it was, they were conducted by the Americans. And the combined yield of that was 38,000 megatons, uh, 30-odd tests. They were some of them were air bursts, some of them were under sea, some of them were top of towers, some of them were on parachutes, some of them were airdrops. And they were all to refine things. But even that, um, some of them were just to confirm things they'd already found. So they were blowing up weapons for the hell of it at that point. And the reason for that, that was 62, was because the year before, the Russians had detonated Sarboma, which was the biggest 
massive super bomb they had. And Kennedy went, oh, holy smokes, uh, you know, the, the test ban treaty is off and we need to prove that we can do better and we need to do better. So we're going to go and send a load of our nukes to the British island in the middle of nowhere. And you can't get further away from anywhere on the planet than Christmas Island in the South Pacific. It takes two days to get there from Hawaii, which is bad enough to get to. Um, And they just detonated and they sent the British troops there. But interestingly, you know, Reagan uh, started compensating nuclear survivors in the 80s signed an act for it if you were at present at a test and you had a, a certain number of radiogenic illnesses you got a payout so brits at operation dominic get a payout from the americans they don't get anything yeah that seventy six thousand pound one-off payment just for having one particular illness so, out of about so the american government has admitted liability to british servicemen well, they had no option because a lot of the early American tests were done on Nevada. And so there was, it's on their own territory, and there was a huge pattern of fallout, sort of south and east, where people who are known as downwinders were irradiated. And so politically, he had no option but to compensate for this. And once you've compensated for doing it on your own territory, you have to then admit that your, your nuclear weapons are dangerous. But, but what you know, you're so- after is, a, is, I mean, compensation, yes, of course, but also... Um- a medal acknowledging the the bravery and heroism of of those who took part um and i've got to say that to me seems like an entirely reasonable thing to suggest not least because it was a military operation um and secondly because as we all know yes for there's plenty of uh um people who are on arctic convoys or or um you know in bomber command or infantry or tanks who saw plenty of action but there were plenty of people who got medals who didn't see any action whatsoever you know cooks and backroom staff and all the rest of it prince charles yeah he's got a chest full of them he's got a chest full of them so it seems to me an incredibly small thing to um to demand and i would have thought the the wider public would be all for it wouldn't they i mean why wouldn't you yeah but you know in the 80s this was a massive huge scandal uh thatcher was forced to answer questions in the house on it um every newspaper was covering it it was on panorama and horizon and everything else today i am literally the only person left in the country who reports on this i think in all the years that i've covered it i've been at the high court case never saw another reporter there the only time i saw any other reporters was 2012 when it went to the supreme court and got effectively thrown out and there was the bbc and a few other people outside who reported on failure of the british test veterans sort of thing but no one else has ever done much on it and i was reading uh, a, a story about an investigation the ft did actually about some financial wrongdoing a little while ago and the reporter on that had spent years sort of trudging after this this scandal and he was told by one of his colleagues, you know, every reporter has a white whale and this one is is mine it's just my my thing because it I can't rest. I can't forget about it. There was um, when I went to that high court case, I met people who I hadn't previously met. Widows of men who had flown through mushroom clouds. Uh, there was a widow who'd had who sobbed on my shoulder. She was in her seventies at the time, and she sobbed on my shoulder about the miscarriages she'd had forty years earlier, and she still missed her children. There was a lady I met whose husband, uh, Mick Clark, his name was. He was a taxi driver. He'd been at the test. He'd gone home terribly on lots of cancers and she came to me and said hello and she said I've kept every single thing you've ever written about this and I'd you know I'd never heard from her um and in 2009 I I interviewed a guy called Barry Smith who was dying and he'd applied for a war pension and one of the horrible vagaries of the British war pension system is that you have to prove what happened to you so if you had your leg blown off in Afghanistan you know, there's not really much arguing about that. It's definitely not there. You can get a second opinion if you're asked to, because that's easy, you know. Um, but if you are irradiated, you are required to prove you are you were irradiated. And the only people who ever took that data or could prove it are the MOD, who it is you're asking to give you the war pension. And a lot of the times they don't have the information anyway. Or if they do, though, they're sitting on it. So Barry was having to go... Through this process, he was having to appeal. He wanted to get a pension to look after his wife, Anna, and his daughters after he'd died. Uh, and he presented some radiology. He had, a, he had an, a kind of cancer that was radiogenic. And he had a load of evidence from Hiroshima experts that this was a kind of cancer that they had seen in Japan as well after the blast. And he went to this final war pension appeal hearing and he had to get off his deathbed to do it. He was very ill at the time. And they got in there 
And this was like the second or third hearing. And the MOD said, oh, yeah, we haven't read these paperwork. Can we have an adjournment, please? And Barry sort of stood up and said, you do realise I'm dying, don't you? Can you read it in the break and come back in here after lunch? And, you know, let's have this decided now. And the tribunal granted the adjournment and Barry went back home. And I spoke to him over the phone. And by that point, uh, his breathing was really bad and he couldn't, his voice was really weak. So Anna had to, she, she said to me, you ask me the questions and I'll ask Barry and I'll tell you what he says because she could understand what he was saying. So we had this weird sort of three-way interview. Uh, at the end of it, I was just sort of winding up and saying, well, thank you very much and, you know, take care because what else can you say? And Anna came back on the phone and she said, um, she said, Barry says, don't give up. Don't let them win. I mean, I'm filling up now just thinking about it, but you can't. And she, she, he died a few days after that. And Anna kept on fighting for the war pension and eventually she lost. I heard from her daughters a little while ago and I said to them, I think about your dad quite a lot. I never met him. But every time the MOD is really obnoxious, I think about what Barry said to me. Mm. And if you can't. If you can listen to the words of a dying man who says, don't let the buggers get away with it. Yeah, you're not going to do ha- it. You're gonna, you've you got to do your bit, haven't you? So, you ca- yeah, so, conscience plays on you. You can't so, let it go. You tell us about Eric Denson, because um, I, I, I wrote a letter to the medals office um, in Gloucester. They're in Gloucester and, they, and um, it's the Gloucester's barracks and it's the Imjim, Imjim barracks, in fact, that they're, that they're in. Right. And, and one of the things I wrote in an angry PS on the letter to them was I said, uh, it's good to see the lads who fought at Imjin, you know, heroically fought at Imjin, which is long forgotten as an early part of the cult, you know, who did their Cold War duty. They at least get a building named after them where, where they're nuclear test vets. On, uh, and one of the things that really bugs me about this, we keep being told that our national security rests on nuclear weapons. So the knowledge that was carved out of these men's sacrifice we rely on and we're told we're at the dispatch box very often with a straight face that our nuclear security is a key part of our security and the men who the men who paid for that aren't honored right it's the thing so i wrote i wrote to them about eric and you talked before about you know flights through the cloud that's what eric did isn't it yeah he was used in what documents called the initial experiment um, he was the pilot. He was an ace RAF pilot. He used to fly radar runs over the Iron Curtain, right? His particular skill was getting past um, radar stations and frightening the Americans. And he used to love doing that and, and blitzing them. And he was about 24, 25, and he got sent to Christmas Island. And uh, his widow, Shirley, said to me, you know, at the time we just were constantly, they were based in Germany anyway, but they were constantly fearing Soviet invasion any day. And they, he went off to Christmas Island uh, and he was tasked with flying a, a converted Canberra bomber through the heart of the mushroom cloud. He was in 7th 6th Squadron and there was a bunch of them that did this. Uh, and the documents that came out afterwards are, are very clear about a number of different planes who, who flew those missions in different bombs um, were terribly irradiated. And Eric's in particular was used in this initial experiment, not on Eric, and not on his plane, but on the Charlie meter, on the radiation uh, measuring instrument inside the cockpit. They wanted to compare the Charlie meter to see if it was working to other measuring devices. So Eric was the pilot. He was right up front underneath just his thin perspex canopy. And he had decimeter badges placed um, on his armrests of his pilot chair, on the headrest behind his head and on the seat pan under his testicles. So we know exactly what dose he got all over his body in different places. Um, And all the men in the crew had this. There were three others. There was a a navigator and an observer as well. And he was in the cloud, I think, for about six minutes. And he went in higher than everybody else. And, you know, the... The conditions inside the mushroom cloud are so turbulent and um, astonishing and extremes of at that height, heat and cold, that they needed the best pilots to do it because they had no idea what they were going to be facing. And they had to try to keep the plane in the cloud for a certain period of time. And in these six minutes, these papers showed that Eric had the equivalent amount of radiation to had about, about 19 Röntgen, which is to the to the back of his head, just to his head about 165 years worth of what would be background radiation in the UK because we're on granite and radon gas emits radiation. It would take you 165 years to get what Eric got in six minutes to his head alone. He had another nine Röntgen to his testicles. 
Um, and he came down and he was sick. He vomited, un- un- unsurprisingly. Um, but he was ill for a couple of days uh, and he was flown home because he'd exceeded his dose. They did have some basic safety limits that you shouldn't be going over so much of, uh, of a dose. And he had exceeded that. So they sent him home and Shirley greeted him and took him home. And he had a big rash all over his chest. He was sick. And she said he had a personality change. He changed overnight. And over the subsequent sort of 20 years, uh, they had a few more children. They ended up with four daughters. Um, and Eric just sort of descended into undiagnosable mental illness. Uh, it took him to lots of shrinks. Couldn't work out what it was. It wasn't depression. It wasn't schizophrenia. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. Um, and he tried to kill himself a couple of times. And on one occasion, Shirley found him in the kitchen sharpening an axe and drinking whiskey. And she said, what, she said, what are you doing, dear? And he said, I'm going to come upstairs and kill you and the children in a minute. And she talked him out of it. And then in 76, in that long, hot summer, he took himself off to the woods and slit his wrists. And uh, he left a note saying he just couldn't take it anymore. He, he used to say to her that he had these crippling, painful headaches really just he said there was a black cloud over him and this this splitting pain in his head and Shirley didn't find out about any of this until years later so about 2009 and she got some FOI requests or something through from the Ministry of Defence that suddenly revealed these documents and suddenly revealed her husband's dose so she applied for a widow's war pension and she got it on the basis that Eric's death was attributable to his service now they never said what bit of his service caused him to commit suicide? Was it the the stress of flying radar runs on the Iron Curtain? Was it the stress of flying through a mushroom cloud? Was it radiation did something to his brain? We don't know. Uh, and the MOD wouldn't say. But they gave her a widow's pension. And a few years ago, I think it was 2012, the government instituted a new medal called the Elizabeth Cross, which is... Uh, sort of equivalent to the Purple Heart in a way. It's, it's, um, it's a very high honour and it's awarded to those who have died in service. So if you are blown up by the Taliban, your family can receive the Elizabeth Cross as a result. Uh, and in Eric's case, because although it was a suicide, his death was attributable to his service. So we have applied, or Shirley's applied with our support, for an Elizabeth Cross for him. We're waiting to hear how that goes. I'm sure they're trying to find their way out of it, but it's being considered at the moment by the Defence Services Secretary, who is he's sort of got two hats on. He works at the MOD and is also a, one of the Queen's courtiers. So we wait to see what happens there. But 20% of Eric's and Shirley's descendants have some kind of birth deformity, mostly missing an extra teeth. Um, one of his daughters has got some spinal problems. Uh, but it's interesting when you speak to different people from different missions and different tests, they have very similar stories for other people in that test. So I know one knew one guy who died a couple of years ago now called Archie Ross, who was an engineer at Christmas Island. And he had a third eyelid growing under his eye. They used to have to go to hospital quite often to have it cut back and then it just kept growing again. And it was obviously very irritating and painful. He went to a regimental reunion, got talking to one of his mates. He had the same problem. And then someone else had the same problem. And you think, hang on, how many people in my unit have got a third eyelid? This is weird. And that's when Archie started to realise that the fact his daughter had a deformed arm and his grandson had downs might be connected to service at the test. And there was one guy I spoke to, because it's not just British tests either. There was one guy I spoke to who used to be in the RAF. He was, uh, I think he was ground crew. And they were, his squadron was sent to Peru. And they were based there flying sampling missions across the Pacific into the French fallout clouds because they did, wow, the French were just super amazing with their nuclear tests. They were very bad. And so we sent our crews through the, the tails of the fallout cloud to sample them to try and see how big they were and what they were making them with. Freeloading off the French tests, basically. Yeah, but we wanted to know what the French were up to. You don't trust the French, right? So, um, <clears throat> and they sent this, this, and they came back and they'd have to clean the, the, the planes down afterwards. And of course, you've got to maintain them. And the jet engines are contaminated, but they're full of grease and oil. You can't wash that stuff out. And you've got to have your head up in the hatch and all the rest of it. And anyway, I was speaking to this guy in his house and he had had um, esophageal cancer, right? He had his tongue out, basically, and he had a hole in his throat that he was talking through. And... He's, he lived in a village outside where his squadron used to be based, along with a load of his old comrades. They all lived in this same couple of streets. And, you know, th- three quarters of them had a hole in their throat that they were talking through. They had all had the same 
problem with their with their throat with their esophagus the fundamental problem with with some of this is that part of the reason i go after it is that you can talk to these people and hear their stories and go well this my god there's something amiss here something has gone wrong whether it's radiation or something else and but they don't look at it that the science is that the government does is kind of set up to fail the nrpb reports that thatcher set up which we're going to hear a, a new review coming out probably by the end of the year was into the total cohort of test veterans right they didn't look at archie ross's unit and how they all had a third eyelid and the statistical likelihood of that they didn't look at this peruvian squadron and the fact they all had throat cancer they just looked at the total cohort of about twenty-two thousand. and the first nrpb study had about fifteen thousand men in and they found elevated rates of leukemia and the second study they suddenly found some extra people that they didn't previously know were at Christmas Island. They added them to the, the cohort and suddenly the numbers of leukaemia just smooth right out, you know? Things like that make you want to bang your head against the wall. But Yeah, it's, it's proper skullduggery, isn't it? I mean, it's it's really... It, it's I mean, shameful. Re- it really is. It's um, A big part of not wanting to admit liability, though, is the, is the fact that these are, there are birth defects caused. So so if you've got a, if you've got 22,000 people in total and they, they all have two kids, three kids... And then they have two, three kids. The MOD, the MOD is thinking, well, in 50 years' time, we're going to be paying compensation to a million people. And we don't want to... I mean, well, yeah, there's, there's about 155,000 descendants, we think, at the moment, from those 22,000. And uh, they have about 10 times the normal rate of birth defects. The normal rate in the population is 2%. So they're, they're about 20% rate of birth defects. Um, and, yeah, if you wanted to pay all them out now, at today's money, that's a lot of... It's a lot of cash. Yeah. You've got a further problem, which is that radiation causes a random change in your genes. So one guy, one baby might be born with no anus. That's happened. And another one gets an extra finger and another baby has blue eyes instead of green eyes. Yeah. Uh, there are some children who have things like eczema and asthma, which are considered fairly common and fairly minor. But, you know, the asthma is really common. Breathing problems are really common in the children of people who were... Um, on the decontamination crews. The decontamination ground crew tend to have things wrong with their guts and their lungs. They always tend to report something like that, duodenal ulcers and stomach cancer and things. But if they, this is one of the mad things you were saying earlier on, if they had paid out early on, if they'd recognised early, and there are memos from admirals at the time saying, we probably ought to have something in place for survivors of hurricane because they're going to they're gonna probably need compensating at some point. If they had paid out then, at that money it would have gone away it would have it would have um a lot of veterans who have fought for so long to be heard would have been satisfied earlier and that's the thing with a medal it's tiny it's cheap it's pretty meaningless in lots of ways but it is a recognition that something happened and there was a conflict and there was a risk and it's the word risk they don't want in terms of kind of what you're you're hoping to see achieved Medal number one, but, <laughs> but but that's that's already been kicked into touch by sounds of things. Well, Conversation, ag- ag- acknowledgement. I mean, sanity. That's what I want to see. Sanity. <laughs> I just, yeah, no, no, I just, I know it's a bit difficult with the Ministry of Defence. Um, but you know, if if James, if you and Al came to my house and I made you a cheese sandwich each and sent you into the garden to eat it, and then one of you came back in and said, oh, I don't feel very well and was sick in, sick in the toilet, I'll go, oh, whatever. But if the other one comes back in and says, well, I feel ill too, I would, I would, you know, I would go and check my cheese. I would check the butter, I'd check the bread, I'd have a look at the knife, I'd ask where you were sitting in the garden and go and look to see if there was some kind of weird fungus there or something. And if subsequently I, I, mean, I had heard that cheese sandwiches had killed people or had caused illness to people on four continents... I would start to question the nature of cheese or something. Yes, you know, that, you would. Because and, and let's face it, we're talking about cheese. We're, what you're talking about is... is, is, is the most terrifying fallout. weapon known to man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, and, you know, which, which we already know is, is incredibly deadly. That's sort of the whole point. But I tell you what, James, if you went to the MOD and you had a cheese sandwich out of their canteen and you fell ill, they would take that more seriously and do more investigations on it yes, than they I do know this. They would. I know, and I know, that is the thing right. that... It's one of the things that pisses me off. And yeah, I've it's, it's quite rightly. It's the logic of saying these are the most deadly weapons known to man that we know can wipe out all living things, that we know can rewrite the DNA of, of all living creatures and animals and plants. 
and we must have them because they are so devastating and they are so apocalyptic and we must spend billions on them but they're harmless to brits that yeah, well what? Well, we're, what? We're different. We're made of something uh, extra special. That, what is, uh, and we have if, phlegm. To, to, go, <laughs> to go back to the, the cheese sandwich analogy, if, 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 the, if you guys were fine with the cheese sandwich but the rest of the world were all poisoned by it, then I'd, I'd want to look at you guys and say, well, what is it about you? Is it because you drink tea that you are protected from <laughs> cheese? You know? yeah. and, but this, the Ministry of Defence doesn't ask for proof. It asks for a standard of proof that science can't provide. Mm. Every other nuclear power recognises, compensates, gives a medal to, gives pride of place in parades to survivors of nuclear tests. Um, Britain's the only one that asks for, for something that doesn't exist in order to prove it. And if someone comes to them and says, I think something is wrong with me, they, sh they have a responsibility to work out what it was. They can't just sit there and go, well, prove it's radiation. It wasn't radiation. I completely well, agree with you. I mean, I think it? the whole thing just sounds absolutely bonkers. I, and, you know, it, it, it is a national disgrace that, yep. that this is still in the dark. I mean, it is absolutely appalling. Yep. And, um, you know, good for you, Susie, for kind of flying the flag on this and, 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 and you, Al. I mean, it's, it's why is it not grip the public imagination? Is it because it's just too dark and too dirty grim. and far it's off too... and too grim? Uh, is, is it because we all feel uncomfortable because the vast majority of people actually are in favour of having nuclear weapons, aren't they? I think still, just about. Um, I think it's I, I don't know. Because... I don't know what it is, but it is an absolute disgrace. Uh, it really when, is appalling. When I take it round, I have taken it round, documentary makers and uh, and things like that and trying to get more um, coverage for it the problem is always that there is no resolution yeah. there is no happy ending it involves old men and deformed children and sickness and it doesn't involve anyone pretty it doesn't involve anything positive there is no resolution at the end where everything is fixed and solved and here is the killer document because it's a combination of there's a halfway house resolution though isn't there there is a, there is a, there is a widespread national public acknowledgement compensation and a medal you know the, 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 of course that's that's nothing compared to what they've suffered but it but it's something isn't it yeah that's what they should have and we, we campaigned for the medal because that was the easiest cheapest easiest most likely um because the, the the criteria for a medal generally is risk and rigor these days we accept the risk of a of the nuclear bomb test far more easily than they were really considered at the time and they were considered risky then you know but our radiation standards have improved since then and all the rest of it um so and we said, look, this is nothing to do with illness. This is the fact that they're at an explosion of a nuclear weapon. Yep. You, you know, you can't say that these are the most yeah, devastating... Yeah, regardless. Regardless of whether they're exactly. ill or not. You can't say they're the most devastating weapons known to man and then say that the men who were closest to them were untouched by them. There's just... It doesn't compute at all. No, yeah, um, And some of these guys were, apart from being in the cloud, some of them, even the station on the ground, were only five, six miles away. Some of them were 30 miles away, but that's still not, you know, the 30 miles from Grapple Y is the equivalent of being in Tunbridge, uh, having a, a three megaton device going off in Tunbridge Wells and asking yourself whether Whitehall would stay where it was. And they wouldn't. They'd be up and off and out and in yeah. a bunker or in Yorkshire as quick as they yeah. possibly could. They would not hang about. And these guys, they lived in the fallout for a year, you know, but it, it doesn't get the traction because... Um, it doesn't have a, a Coronation Street celebrity attached to it. It's just got Al Murray, right? It doesn't have, <laughs> it doesn't have the Daily Mail behind it. It's just got Boniface of the Mirror. It, yeah. And, uh, and also, frank, part of it is that the Cold War's over. It's, that's history. It's dead and buried, the Cold War. So any Cold War hangover is, is, is sort of seen as irrelevant to our lives now. Would, would, yeah, and it, it's because our history stops yeah. In August 1945. Yeah. That's where our history education stops with yeah. um, with VJ Day. Yeah. Uh, most of us, it's just VE Day. And then there's a little bit of, oh, yeah, and there were some bombs on Japan. They were pretty bad. And then everything that comes after that, 46, 49, Einstein, tube alloys, anything, it's just the other stuff is just forgotten. And I didn't know any of this until I started reporting on it and become fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's it's one of those things that once you figure it out, you think, how can everyone have forgotten what's going on? And there's loads of good arguments 
for having nuclear weapons. There are some fascinating details about how amazing it was that this war-torn, tiny little country, crippled by austerity and rationing, still managed to do this amazing technological feat. I mean, one of the things that Penny did, right, at Nagasaki, was uh, he had noticed um, that there are a number of sort of paint cans and stuff that got crumpled by the blast. So he took a note of them and took them back to his laboratory and studied them. And then later on, he was, uh, after about 46, the Americans were doing some tests in the Marshall Islands and Penny was part of it. And he set up a load of semi-filled paint cans around the target area. And the Americans, who had these amazing measuring devices, said, oh, what are you doing, you mad Brit? Look, look like some kind of nutty professor. And then after the blast... All the Americans' whizzy tech crumpled in the blast wave. It was completely useless. But Penny's paint cans were there to be found and studied, and they were able to work out exactly the pattern of the blast and the power and the yield of the weapon because of, of what Penny had done. And that kind of amazing, you know, perhaps slightly British, slightly quirky way of looking at a problem is, is a fantastic story. There's so much in it. And the fact that it had this price to pay, a lot of the veterans have said to me, you know, if we knew this was going to happen, we would probably still have done it. But we wouldn't have had children when we came home or I wouldn't have married when I came home. You know, they didn't tell them everything and they didn't protect them. And they have now said, you need to prove what is wrong with your DNA and the veterans don't have the initial well, that's records simply, of that. And that's simply impossible. Um, well, it's becoming more possible. It may be that in the next year or two, there's some studies that might come back on that. But you're still not going to have that Union Jack flag in your DNA that says Churchill did this, you know. Well, Susie, thanks so much for talking to us. I know that I do know that a lot of people who listen to this podcast are our current servicemen. And I, uh, how I always feel about this is... is Maybe they need. Maybe they have an eye to what's happened to the nuclear test veterans, who, after all, were mainly national servicemen and not volunteers. Um, but thank you so much for talking to us. Um, if you're a li- if you're a listener, write to your MP and say I listened to this thing the other day, and it's a disgrace, a total disgrace. And I would appreciate your getting behind the campaign for a medal for the nuclear test veterans. The medals committee um, wrote back saying that the the po- all right it was an austere posting. I mean, they were nuked. I mean, how? Are- how austere a posting do you need? Yeah, and um, actually, uh, the, the veterans minister just to butt in. The veterans minister Johnny Mercer said the other day that it didn't qualify as a military operation because they weren't being shot at. No, they were being nuked by their own they, government. Yeah, but they, it's all right. <laughs> they weren't in any danger. But thanks so much, Susie. Um, Thank uh, you for having me. Uh, oh, it's a it's well, let me have you at the Chalk Valley History Festival then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's him, blacklisted. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, we hope you enjoyed this. I know it wasn't the Second World War. We did deviate a little, but you know, yeah, no, there, there are stuff. there are other interesting things in life. It turns out. Um, thanks Thank again, you. Susie. Um, uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Cheerio. Cheerio.